raised in Portland, Oregon, same house my whole life. I mean, really? in Eugene, Oregon. I was raised in Eugene, Oregon, the same house my whole life. But in the 70s, the recession came and all the clubs kind of went away. And so we all moved up. We all, meaning uh, the band I was playing with, moved up to Portland. Right. A yeah, place to be. I hear it's a great city. I've not been there yet. Hopefully one day not too, not too long away. God, this make this virus go away. Um, I'll just, I've just started recording now. So if it's all right with you, I'll just back up to, to welcome you again, because okay. this is pre-recorded. Um, Curtis, welcome to A Breath of Fresh Air. Let's start with, you have to tell me about your John Belushi connection. Hi, Sandy. <laughs> Hi, you? Curtis. It's a very long story. I'll try and give you a Reader's Digest version. It has been written in print many times and uh, in lots of interviews. I have no problem telling this, this story. I've been telling it since it happened. And tell my listeners they're dying to hear. Um, it starts, uh, just to put it all together, just to fill in some uh, empty space. I was living with a bass player for the Robert Cray Band. And uh, he was in Robert Cray Band, and his name was Richard Cousins. And I was in a band called the Nighthawks, two bands. So we were popular in Eugene, and we would play at a venue called the Eugene Hotel in their ballroom there. Okay. The reason I'm telling you, you'll see why. Okay. <laughs> and then we also would play in the lounge of the Eugene Hotel. So we had a gig there. And Robert has his band and I'm in my band. And we put both bands together. And we did a double review, rhythm and blues review in the ballroom of the Eugene Hotel. Richard and I lived together in about two weeks. We did this gig that I'm going to tell you about. It's how I met Bellucci. Richard Cousins comes up to me and goes, I guess there's a movie in town and Robert's got a part in it. I was like, really? And that's about it. It was just like, oh, we kind of tripped on it for a while. And, you know, a couple of weeks went by and now we're playing in this ballroom and we're doing a gig. And on Friday night, um, Robert Cray opened up and I finished. And on Saturday night, the Nighthawks, my band opened up and Robert would finish. And during my set on Saturday night, a uh, basically a cocaine dealer came up and yanked on my, I, we all know who he is because everybody gets their blow from him, right? And he walks up and yanks on my pant leg and yells at me in the middle of a song, hey, Bellucci wants to meet you. Well. I don't know what he's talking about. I thought he sneezed or something like that. What? <laughs> Bellucci wants to meet you. Hey, man, Bellucci wants to meet you. I have no idea what he's talking about. All right. Simple reason, for the simple reason that Richard and I don't own a television. And secondly, we work Saturday nights. That's that's the that's the cream gig for any musician. So I never saw Saturday Night Live, and I have no idea who John Bellucci is, nor do I care. And so he's yelling at me, Bellucci wants to meet you. And I told him in no certain terms to bug off. And uh, at the end of the set, I get off the stage and I'm walking towards some friends of mine. And this guy, his name was Richard as well, but he was about five feet tall. We used to call him Little Dick and he was the, the dealer, right? So he walks towards these friends and he grabs me and he goes, Bellucci, like this, like ta-da. And I come up and I shake his hand and I, and I don't know who he is, like, hi, you know. And he's about, I would say he's about 5'4", and about, and he's very stocky, like this, you know. And that I can picture it in my head. And I shake his hand and I go like this. I go like, yeah. And he says, yeah, I like your music. I like how you're singing. And, like your band you remind me of a friend of mine his name is dan Aykroyd, and he plays harmonica too and i look at him just blank blank because personally i don't give a shit and um <laughs> and, and, and every hippie in the nation plays harmonica you know 
and not very well. And so I'm just thinking, oh, that's nice. I have no idea what he's for or even at the, you know, I don't know who he is, so I don't know why and why Dick is telling me he's... So I go, oh, great. And I'm trying to break away. And he goes, yeah, I'm with the movie that's in town. And I first thing I said to him after hearing that was like, oh, you're with a... Yeah, I heard about... You know, Robert's in that movie, and he goes, I said, did you see Robert Cray today? You know, I just thought of it. And he goes, yeah. And as a matter of fact, he taught us how to dance. And so we talked a little bit about it. And um, you know, Robert Cray and Richard and myself used to do a side gig in that lounge of that hotel every Monday night and other gigs. Right. So we used to dance together, you know. So when he said that, I, I laughed and whatever. And then the conversation starts to die down. And he goes, well, I, I really like your music. Uh, you know, I'm with this movie and I have to fly from New York City to Portland, Oregon, and then drive down here to Eugene. Eugene is 109 miles south of Portland. Uh -huh. So, and then I have to go back. This is Saturday night. And he goes, tomorrow I have to drive back to Portland and then catch a plane and go all the way back to New York City. But man, I'm really excited about going back because I work on this variety show. I still don't know what he's talking about. <laughs> he goes, I work on this variety show and uh, we're going to do a show with Ray Charles. And that's when he had my attention. I went, what? You're going to do a show with Ray Charles? And the first things out of my mouth was, you got to ask him about Guitar Slim. And he goes, who's Guitar Slim? You don't know who Guitar Slim is? Oh my God, 1953, the biggest hit. It's like a huge R&B blues song called The Things I Used to Do. Matter of fact, Ray Charles plays piano on it. And I'm, I'm telling you this, but I'm telling him this. You know? <laughs> yeah. I go, Ray Charles plays piano. He ran the session. And, and then I said, um, I mean, I started describing to him, I'm very excited about music, about this music. And I just want him to know everything about Guitar Slim. And the next thing I said, you got to ask Ray Charles, did you know he plays saxophone? He goes, Ray Charles plays saxophone? I go, yeah. Uh, um, live at Newport, 1958, Atlantic Records. He plays on a song called Hot Rod. I and, I, you know, I, so I'm going like this. And he just looks at me and he goes, let's go smoke a joint. So... <laughs> We're in a hotel, we go up and he has a room or something or somebody gave him one, probably because he's young, I don't know. But next thing I know, I'm in a room and we spend about a half an hour shooting the breeze, smoking weed, and I'm late to the next show, which is, <laughs> you know. But the thing is, is we exchanged it. About four days later, he calls me up and says, Curtis, Judy Jacqueline, that's his wife, he says, Judy is, is making dinner and would you come and join us for dinner and bring your records? And this, so this story goes on and on and on and on. Uh -huh. So you developed, from there, you developed a really firm friendship. I brought him, I brought him everything. I, you know, I taught him, hey, bartender. So can I tell you that? You'll like this. Yeah. So now I know there's a movie in town and I work on Saturday. So it'll be a long time before I even see Saturday Night Live. And this is 1977. And... Um, this is before Blues Brothers, and this is before, you know. So we're playing in that lounge part. It's Richard Cousins, Robert Cray, myself, and a drummer named Dave Olson. And we're playing, and the place is packed. I mean, we usually do pretty good, but everybody is talking, and I, there's a whole, everybody knows everybody, and everybody's meeting at this because Bellucci's coming down. And I still don't know or how popular or, you know, uh, how good this guy is, really, as a comedian and a writer. So, but we noticed that the crowds are surging. There's this movie in town, right? So we play a set and we get off. And it's at the end of the night and Bellucci comes up and says, Curtis, hey. Now, by this point, I'm going over and playing him records and stuff. He goes, can I sit in with you? And I said, Sure. Uh, you know, I'm kind of like, I don't know if this guy can play or do anything. So I said, sure. <laughs> you were just being goes, polite. Yeah, yeah. So I said, sure. What do you want to do? He goes, jailhouse rock. And I was like, no, no, we're not going to jam or jam jailhouse rock. To me, that's corny. And I said, that's corny. And he goes, how about Johnny Be Good? And I said, no, uh, everybody <laughs> and their dog does Johnny Be Good. I tell you what, I'll bring you a record 
I got, I, I'll, I'll find something for you. And I found Hey Bartender. Literally, I just, I don't even know if he can play, but to sh- show sh- you the truth, I wanted to do the song. So I said, so I brought him the song over to his house, and he dug it. The following Monday, the following Monday, we play there every Monday. He's there. The place is packed. And I said, he goes, I learned the song. Can I sit in? I said, yeah. I'll tell you what. We'll play our set, and then I'll call you up for the last song of the set. So we play our set, and I announce him, and the audience went ape shit. They just, it was like the beat. Yeah, yeah. And I, I'm going like, you know, it, it kind of pissed me off, actually. I mean, I was like, <laughs> who is this guy? And he gets up on stage, and we started off. And Sandy goes, you know, ba 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 da da went balling the other night, ba 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 da da got drunk, and I got real tight. Well, he goes like this, ba 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 da da went balling the other night. I saw the drinking and I got real, he's doing this. And I'm looking and I'm going, they're going nuts, the audience. And I'm getting kind of, I'm getting hurt. You know, it's just like, oh, this is terrible. And then I notice it's like, is that Joe Cocker? This is the truth. Is that Joe Cocker? What is he? Because he's doing all the hand and this and that and whatever. And he yeah. does a good Joe Cocker. And I'm looking at him and I'm just like, so at the end of the song, the audience goes berserk. I jump off, kind of like, you know, I don't know what just happened, but I didn't think it deserved that. I had no idea the connection. So he goes, hey, hey, and he goes, what'd you think? And so I said, is that Joe Cocker? Were you just doing Joe Cocker? He goes, yeah, yeah, I, I do him in that show. I was telling you that, sh- I do an imitation on that. But I go, okay, so let me get this straight. You're John Bellucci, and you're doing a song by Floyd Dixon, and you're singing it like Joe Carr. <laughs> and so I reached out, and I and we're standing right here in the middle of the dance floor, and I tap his chest, and I go, you need to be yourself. If you're going to do this music, you got to come from yourself. And I touched his heart. Like, you got to come from here and be yourself. That's who you are. And this is what he did. He goes, yeah, you're right. And that's it. That's really the only, besides bringing him music and hipping him to who was who and whatever, and him coming and watching me play many times, that's all I really told him. Amazing. The thing about John is, the thing about John was, is that uh, uh, he was in person, like I'd go over to his house and he wasn't like a funny guy all the time, like you think, but he's a serious writer and a serious in his craft. I went to his house one of the times to, to visit and, you know, bring him records or hang out. And so we had made friends. He goes, here, sit next to me. So I sit down. I go, what are you doing? He goes, I'm watching Gunsmoke. And he saw, and I here's the television right there, you know, it's right in front of us. And we're sitting on a couch. And he goes, I'm watching Gunsmoke. And every actor, bit actor that came on the program, he would mimic. And I realized he was riffing. Like, so someone would come on and go, fan mail, you know, hey, there's mail call for Mr. Dillon. And he'd go, mail call for Mr. Dillon. And he'd say, and he knew every character actor. He goes, oh, that's so-and-so. He's a great man. He's in this and that. And he just, he knew all the character actors and he'd mimic them. And he'd copy their voices. I mean, even Miss Kitty, you know, he'd step in and he'd be like, <laughs> oh, she's this and that. The fan, you know, mail call for Mr. Uh, Dillon. He'd go, mail you? call for Mr. Dillon. So wow. it was, I was wow. just sitting here. It was like listening to a record and practicing guitar. Right. He was watching Gunsmoke. Practicing voices. Ripping. Right. Yeah. But was that the last time we ever saw Joe Cocker come out of it? Uh, yeah, the first and only. Oh, I, of course, later on, you know, with YouTube and stuff, I finally saw it. Or, or you know, there's uh, VHS had... You know, I never really paid that much attention to Saturday Night Live. I've seen a bunch of them, a handful of them, you know, but um, so he actually you, he said my name on Saturday Night Live, you know. Well, and I and I believe there's a dedication to you on the album cover too from yes. the Blues Brothers, yes. right? Yes. And uh, Cab Calloway plays a character named Curtis. So, so yeah, I have you- become... 
Yeah, I became friends with John until he died, and I'm friends now with Jim Bellucci, and I know Dan Aykroyd. I've met probably five or six times right. over my career. He's the nicest person. I've done his show a couple of times. and Ah, you had a pretty um, big impact on, on old John. I would say, you know, I was told this, and then we'll... Move on, yeah. Move on. Uh, I was told this. He goes, yeah, my, I, you know, my friend, I told you about him. He's, and I remember this, I'm at his, their dinner table. And, the, you know, I went over there a few times and had dinner. He goes, you know, my friend Dan was trying to get me into the blues and I wasn't into it. And he goes, and, and that's what, because he has an idea. And basically, and this will knock you out, Dan Aykroyd's from Toronto, Canada. Uh -huh. And he was already into the blues and he championed a band called the Down Child Blues Band. And that band had two brothers in it, had not two brothers, but there was two members of the band who were who, brothers. Right. Ah. The blues. So Here that's we get where the blues was, brothers. he was trying to get, he was trying to get Bellucci on board. And basically I was John's, John wasn't into it. And then when he saw me like an actor, he had something he could put, hang his hat on. Right. right. So I was, his, I was his muse. And I don't regret it one bit. I don't, you know, people go, you're the blue, you know, you know, man, it's Aykroyd's idea. John and Aykroyd are the Blues Brothers. It's, that's their brilliant skit. You know? Yeah, that well, might not have happened without you, Curtis. You know, I, I you know. I have you been anyone else's muse or, or does he take sole claim on that? No, that's, you know, that, you know, I never... I'm not out there trying to be a muse. I just want people to know this music, you know. Yeah, and I, you do I'm, it so well. I'm, I'm, I'm your yeah. your music is awesome. If I can just kind of lead up to to where we're going, you were with Robert Cray Band for a lot of years, weren't you? Uh six or seven. I can't. So, I mean, Robert Cray Band was and is still really huge. That they were awesome through the seventies. But you, nobody really knew your name as part of that band. Is that what brought about your leaving? No, no. What happened was is uh, um, Robert moved to Eugene, Oregon, in like nineteen seventy five, and we had a band called the Nighthawk. Uh -huh. And I was told there's these two cats from the black community, young, who were into the blues and into soul and stuff. At, at those times, man, it was shout out loud, I'm black and I'm proud. It was Marvin Gaye. It was Marvin Gaye. It was huge, you know, yeah. it's the 70s, about 75. But I met Richard Cousins, who became one of my close, he's like my brother. And he and Robert moved to Eugene. And word got out, and I ended up meeting them, and we just hit it off, the, you know. So we had the same record collection, you know. And so we were into Howard Tate, and we were into Johnny T. We were into all this stuff, you know. Right. So we hit it off, and um, Robert had his band. I wasn't even old enough to play in a bar yet. I was playing in a bar, but I wasn't legally. Okay. If the liquor You're a bad boy was, from the beginning. Well, if the liquor commission showed up, you went into the kitchen. Right. That was the rules. So I was playing in a bar at the age of 18. So uh, I met these guys and we're on the same page. And so what happened was, is that as time went on, we're playing together. I ended up, my band, the Nighthawks, didn't want to go on the road and see the world and become big and famous. And that was I our happy dream. in Eugene. So... You know, we would play up and down the entire, uh, it's called I-5. It runs from way up in Canada all the way down through, you know. And we'd play the I-5 corridor pretty much. Uh -huh. And every, you know, up and down. So my point is, is that my band didn't want to go on the road. And I, this is all I know how to do. And I wanted to make a career of music, of blues and R&B. And so uh, I joined Robert Cray. And this is what happened. As time went on, we got really, really popular and we scored sure a record did. deal. Yeah. We got we scored a record deal. And we were opening up for Joan Armor Trading and Bonnie Raitt, and we were doing those things were growing and, and we scored a record deal. And I did one record with Robert. But what happened was is that the guy who produced the record, Bruce Bromberg, wasn't interested in the band. They were only interested in Robert. Robert's young, black, and gifted, and representing 
uh, the blues. The blues, of this course. Is, this is keeping, you know, yes. the tradition going. Yeah. And the rest of us, including Richard Cousins, were just kind of like, you know. Background. So we only got to play on like four songs, and the name of the record is called Who's Been Talking. And uh, so, uh, so on a massive or a kind of popular thing nobody knew who i was but that was the writing on the wall they weren't interested in a harmonica play robert didn't need a harmonica player i'm a front man that blows harp you know and and, and robert plays guitar i mean he needs a horn section i right. knew that but, but you and, were and, singing and, with him too weren't you oh yeah we did all sorts of stuff i have tapes and tapes of it you know matter of fact spotify just released a 45 minute set from uh I just saw it. It's Robert Cray, and this is live in Eugene, Oregon. I just saw it a few minutes ago. It's like whew, nobody told me, uh, but yeah, it's that uh, happens. yeah. So, um, so yes, we did all we do. You know, Joe Tex. We do Sam and Dave. We do, uh, you know, uh, Al T and T Braggs. You know, we do some stuff nobody do. Right. And so I, you. you know, so when you when you left him. Um, to to form your own band, um, did you leave on good terms? Yeah, you know there was an argument and stuff, and we and we um, we separated. But basically, man, immediately it's like I knew he didn't need it. He's a front man. I'm a front man. Huh. I knew it wasn't going to work. And of course, there was a row or something. But it wasn't a row. It's just like, you know. And then we're he's still my friend today. You know, you That's know awesome. bands get in fights. You know, no. So, Does that happen? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so you know, it's just like like this or whatever. But actually, no. It's just like I knew the writing was on the wall, and it kind of reached a point, and it's just like we separated, and three, four weeks later, we're friends again. You know. Right. Oh, cool. So it's like they're just like, a family like, tiff. Yeah. Richard. Richard Cousins is still a good friend of mine. Robert. Robert isn't. He's very private, but. He played my benefit and stuff. And cool. When we see each other, it's a big hug, you know. Nice. We hang so, out and laugh. And so, go Curtis, on. Curtis, you're fronting your own band now, but it, it hasn't come so easy for you. You've been through a few health challenges of late and you've overcome each one, haven't you? Um, it isn't hard. As that's, it isn't that it isn't hard. See, you're fronting your own band and it's not so easy. What's not so easy is, is the pain of an operation and recovering. Fronting a band is what I do and running a business and having a band and I have management and whatever. But I've had some obstacles, which is health. And uh, um, I got clean and sober in 1988, October 9th. And I just had enough. I knew I was gonna. It was gonna take me out. I had some close calls. It's just I quit. I quit everything. I don't drink. I don't smoke. I don't smoke pot. I don't do drugs, and I quit. So I have 32 years of sobriety, and well I, I personally just don't want to feel any other way than how well, I you, feel. Yeah, I get. I so, really get that. Yeah, yeah. So, but it almost killed me anyhow because the damage done. You know, uh, I had I got hepatitis C. Um, I was never strung out on anything. I was just your. I just did everything. If it came my way, I'd do it. Oh, let's try <laughs> this. Let's try this. We, you know. So that was that was kind of it. Um, then I quit. But the results of that, the consequ the consequences outweighed the payoffs. That's what happened. And then. You know, I got a. I had to get a liver transplant. I was given six months to live. I, I, yeah, you're kidding me. I had a tumor the size of a golf ball in my liver, and it's, you know, I had no health insurance. Oh, they God. put on a benefit for me. A Bonnie rate paid my rent for like four months. Uh, Robert Cray played my benefit. Taj Mahal played my dinner. And oh, how awesome. Steve Miller played my benefit. Rick Estrin and, the, and Little Charlie and the Nightcats played my benefit. Even Everclear. The, oh. uh, and you've come out the other side of it. Your health's now good. Yeah, I get checked for cancer still. It's, it's a game you play, you know. What did, what did you learn from that experience? Has well, it changed you? Oh yeah, I don't write about it, but it's basically 
life is finite. Life is finite. Life is, uh, it all seems so meaningless, really. What's important? And uh, I've always been that kind of a person. I'm a pretty up person, you know, but it's, it's yeah, it's kind of like, hello, flowers. Hello, little bug. Hello, you know, whatever. It's just like, hello, spider. You know, puts it all into perspective, right? Yeah, you you smell, you know, smell the. It puts things in perspective, and really, it makes just like, it really makes, it makes a lot of stuff meaningless. What we're doing, you know. But you're right. This day and age. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Your writing has changed a lot as a result, hasn't it? It, uh, you've got a reputation for. uh, for, for songwriting, for your ability to wring out every ounce of soul out of every song that you perform, for writing these really insightful and soul-searching lyrics. Is that all as a result of, of the illnesses that you suffered? I don't think so. I mean, I, I'm not going to say it is. It, it is uh, it's growing older. Uh, uh, this new record, you know, it's just getting older and wiser. And, and then yeah, that secondly... Helps. And then secondly, it's being around the right people and the right musicians and the right songwriters. So I'm getting better as a songwriter. I don't, what you're saying is very, very nice. That's, I mean, thank you, but man, uh, you know, the girl. No, I'm, I'm, I'm actually you know. glad to hear that it's maturity and, and age that are impacting yeah. equally too. I wrote this record that we're talking about, and it's an honor to talk to you, by the way. So, um, and I appreciate My the honor. push. So, so. No, I love um, it. Absolutely love the record. It's called Damage Control. I mean, that that's a, that that the title track. What are you writing per- about there? So, um, first of all, I started writing this record in 2017, and it was scheduled to come out in February. I know it was finished in February and then it was scheduled to come out in uh, June 26, but COVID hit. Mm. And uh, I was like looking and going, you know, with all the wacky COVID stuff, the songs on this record, people are going to think pertain to. COVID. Uh, so it's a good opportunity. Damage Control, the music is written by one of the best Hammond B3 and soul singers of all time. His name is Michael Finnegan. And Michael Finnegan played this groove that is the music. And I took my phone, and this was in L.A. about four years ago. And I, I said, God, I love that. So I kept it. And then when I got back in 2018, I said, Michael, I flew to his house, and we started writing stuff. And I said, do you remember this? And we put the song together. I helped him write a bridge, blah, blah, blah. And we finished it up. And then um, I couldn't, you know, what's the lyrics? Where do you start? So I'm giving you how this came about. And Uh and I have a friend of mine, his name is Ryan Waters, and he's the guitar player for Sade. And then after she kind of retired, he went to Prince. So he's in the Prince camp. So there's a nice name to drop, right? (laughs) But Ryan, Ryan is an old friend of mine. He's about 15 years younger than me or more. And he's just a hot, hot guitar player, great kid, right? But he'll send me stuff. And he wrote these, he wrote this line that went, another day is just beginning, another day will soon end. And all that's in between is what you call this life, my friend. And I, I took that, I called him up, I said, want to help me write a song? And he goes, so I said, can I use these four lines? He goes, you can do anything you want. He just gave me this. It was for another song that he had, you know, that him and I were tossing around. So then I finished the rest of it. Cool. And uh, I took a couple of lines, but basically the hook, you know, um, let's see, I, I can't think of the words right now because I'm pressured. We'll, but we'll, the we'll listen to it so we'll hear yeah, it yeah, anyway. Yeah. It's, a, it's an awesome song and an absolutely awesome we album. Have- Go yeah, on. yeah. We didn't ask to be here. This is to answer your question. We didn't ask to be here. We didn't have a choice. Uh, uh, nobody asked our opinion because we don't have a voice. So I just like take it easy, slow my breathing, stay down low, keep my head up, and deal with this damage control. And that's what life is: is damage control. 
and, and uh, so we finished that. I finished the lyrics of that in, in uh, probably October of, uh, it doesn't matter, but I finished the lyrics. But here's the thing. Have you ever lost your car keys? <laughs> no. Sure. Have, have you ever forgot to bring your purse and you know you got to have it for driving and so you go into the house and you go get your purse but you put your keys on the table uh -huh. and then you walk out and lock the door and you realize yeah. oh my you've god i've locked out. myself out uh -huh. yeah yeah and you've got somewhere to go you know and that's damage control and then if, you know then there's our ex-president that's damage control <laughs> then there's COVID. that's major damage control so the life is damage control and then of course with the operations and stuff and everything but I don't, I don't, I don't cry about it. You know, it's just, you get it over yeah. with, you pick yourself up and, and you move, move on. on. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Um, is that why it's taken four years between albums? No, it's, that's just either money or, you know, getting it. Uh, and um, my manager's always been on me about this because it's supposed to put a record tour, record tour, record tour. And he is like, you know, uh, my manager's name is Shane Tappendorf, and he should get producing credits on this record because basically he's the one that keeps pushing you, know, you. Yeah, pushing, but also like in order, like go to this studio. Here's we have the money now to do it. Right. Da 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 right. da. You know, uh, he he does the phone call to put to to, uh, and then the rest, the music part and the arrangement part, That's the lyric parts is me. But Close. he's the one that kind of makes it happen. Where does that, he you Sorry. Know. Yeah, well, that and my girlfriend at home. So they kind of, you know, but that's a very good question. You're the first to ask it. You know, I'm not Bob Dylan. I can't write, just write songs off, you know. Um, but basically, it just, it's just circumstances. That's all, all right. I can say. All right. You've played all over the world. You've, you've been to so many countries. How come it is that you've not been to Australia yet? I've been wanting to play Australia my whole life. That's the truth. Well, where are you? Uh, uh, someone's got to hire us, you know. The promoter's got to go, we'll give you this, and you come here and, you know. I've been offered to go on a, on a, on a like, with another band that might be there. I've had a couple of bites. How would you like to go to Australia? You know, it's like. I'm I'm a huge creature fanatic, and so Australia is like you know the land. <laughs> well, yes, like we are known for our like, wildlife, like, for like, sure. Well, we've got there's a massive blues festival that happens Easter time every year. I'm not sure how it's going to be happening this year, but right. uh, maybe I'll, I'll drop your name into the promoter there. It'd be great to see you out here. You just would suit it fantastically. Have you ever heard of Lloyd Jones? I think I, Lloyd went there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, there's, there, we've had some brilliant acts out here. Of course, now we have to wait a little while because of COVID right. before everyone can travel again. But would be would be great to see you. Is the plan now to get out and tour this album? I mean, when you can get out and tour? Uh, well, um, I sure hope so, but there is no plan. That's kind of what the whole world is going through, and you can relate to this. We all can. That's the one thing that kind of makes it, kind of do is like, I'm not the only one here. We're all doing with this and dealing with this. And I think part of the problem is, is that we don't know what the future is. And usually our lives are put on calendars and you make plans, you have a job to go to, you got this, this, and this, and you know how your day or month and, oh, yeah, and you look forward yeah, going on vacation, yeah. you look forward to these. And now it's like, is that gonna happen? Is that gonna be, you don't, it's gone. Yeah. And it's driving us nuts. You yeah. Know? And yet we've and, got to ride through it. I mean, that's your damage control that you talk about, right? So right, right. it's a great track. What what other what other track is one of your favorites on the album? Well, my favorite is um, one of them is always say I love you at the end of your goodbyes, which is uh, uh, you know, if you're with somebody that you care about and you should always say, even if you're mad at them, if it's you're someone who's close to you, go, I love you, you know, whatever, because you don't know what's going to happen. And uh, so, but um, I like you're going to miss my sorry ass. <laughs> and, 
And the reason is, is that um, I heard two people arguing on one of the blues cruises. You know? Right. And I was at the end of the boat looking out at the back and the sun is setting. And there's this couple about 20 feet from me and they're having an argument. You could tell, you could feel the vibe and hear some mumblings. And I look over and I ignore it. And then all of a sudden, she, the woman walks away. And he just turns around. He's got a drink in his hand and a cigarette. And he goes, oh, yeah. When I'm dead and gone, you're going to miss my sorry ass. <laughs> So, <laughs> and you got your pen out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I wrote it down and then thought, how do I make a story out of this? And the story is basically partially true. It's based on two friends of mine, one who I grew up with, whose name was Rick Johns, who was really a fine person, but he got it turned into a, a got very addicted and was caught up into a major addiction. And he literally robbed a convenience store, probably the first on planet Earth, with a syringe. Oh, oh with a syringe. Yeah, yeah. yeah. With a nice. He said, you know, give me the money or I'll poke you with my, you know, syringe you and give yeah. you AIDS. You know. Yeah, yeah. And uh, he, they, they put him up the river for that, you uh -huh. know, for a, quite a while. And... Uh, he later on, just a couple, his brother called me up two years ago and said that he had passed away of an yeah. overdose. Sorry so, to hear. That's yeah, awful. no, no, no. So the other one is a piano player friend of mine. His name is D.K. Stewart. And he's a great keyboard player. But when him and I used to run around, both of these guys would put me in trouble and pull me out. Like, I mean, um, I'd be in a house and somebody pulls a gun or something. And, but the reason I'm there is because I'm hanging out with him. You know, and the reason this, so that's what the song is based on, okay. is, uh, is uh, what's so bad about doing wrong, saying sorry won't change the past. When you look on back and think of it, you're going to miss my sorry ass because I, I, I showed you, come on, you got to admit it. You had a great time. So I that's. Nobody else is noticing the song, but it's my fave. Yeah, nice. Thank you. Um, Thanks for sharing it, Curtis. Yeah. Even though you're you're clean and straight these days, are you still the bad boy? Um, you'd have to ask my girlfriend. That <laughs> what takes would other. She say? I don't yes. think I am. <laughs> oh, so lot, so much has changed. Yes, right? <laughs> the answer is yes. Yeah, great. I'm a knucklehead. I am a severe knucklehead. Yes. Well, we, we do love a good knucklehead, especially one who can sing and move and write like you. Thanks so much for talking to me today. It's Perfect. been an absolute pleasure. I really appreciate you sharing your time like this. And um, if, if I say goodbye, I'll, I'll have to say I love you too. Yeah, I love you too, Sandy. Thanks for the push. That was a perfect thing. I hope I didn't talk too much. You get no, me you're, started. You're, you're awesome, yeah. Curtis. It's been an absolute pleasure. I hope I can do justice to everything that you've given me. I'll, I'll uh, dribble it out over a few different things. And I really hope we see you here in Australia. Oh, and man. If, I would, you'll have to let me know if, you, if you're getting that. here. Oh, I'll man, definitely... I've been wanting to play there for a Great. long time. Yeah, well, yeah. let's see if we can make that happen for you. That'd be great All to right. have you here. All the very best. Meantime, Curtis Salgado, it's been wonderful chatting to you. Really appreciate all the storytelling. And even more, we really appreciate your music. Thank you. Peace and bacon grease. Thank you so much. <laughs> All the best, Curtis. Bye now. Bye-bye.